talk, I think it's so you can see, right? This is from like 2007 or something like this. And at that time, I was very actively involved with a bunch of people. I'll tell you more about that. There was some biological context. And we wrote these papers in red. And the title of this talk is On Semigraphoids, Permutahedra, and Mice. And I think I haven't given it in a long time, but uh, I was sort of motivated to, to give this talk now, you know, because I think it fits in well. There's not so much algebra in this talk. It's more combinatoric statistics and, and biology, but I think it... The uh, extend? Okay. Anyway, so here it goes. Everybody sit down. Okay, let's look at this picture. Oops, no picture. Okay. So here's the permutahedron. Okay, so this is the, uh, the uh, three-dimensional permutahedron. So you take the 24 permutations of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. And you plot them as points in four-dimensional space. Right? So these are actually coordinates. So that's a point in four-dimensional space with coordinates 3, 4, 1, 2. Okay? So they all sum to 10. Right? So there are 24 points. They all have coordinates summing to 10. So they lie in a three-dimensional space. And you take the convex hull and you get the permutahedron. Okay? No. Okay, so there's a two-dimensional permutahedron. That's a hexagon. There's a three-dimensional permutahedron. There's this thing. And then you have such a permutahedron in any dimension. So if you take permutations in Sn, you get the n minus one-dimensional permutahedron. Now, in this permutahedron, um, some of the edges are marked and some of them are not marked. Right? So in this picture, so some of the edges I marked with these black dots and some are not marked. Okay. Just a choice I made. Uh, notice that the faces are uh, the faces of the permutahedron are hexagons and squares. Right? There are six squares and eight hexagons, 14 faces altogether. Okay. okay, I'd like you to get into the mental state and focusing on the marked versus unmarked edges. And uh, let's look at this version. I'd like you to see a cube. <laughs> How so? Well, suppose we have a permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4, or any four distinct numbers. Right? So if I had a, a data set, four numbers, four measurements that are different. I have you know, a number, a number, a number, a number, and there's a, an ordering, and that's the permutation. But suppose that this is, measurement is a time series, right? So I measure the value of my favorite stock you know, today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and on Monday, or oh, whatever, Sunday, okay? Um, I guess the stock market is closed. Okay, whatever. So I measure the time, the, the value, and, and all I care is not so much, you know, all the permutation, but just whether the value went up or down, right? If you invest in the stock market, that's maybe the feature you're most interested in. And you record, we call that the up-down analysis. Okay. So you look at these four numbers, and an up-down analysis, all remember is, you know, so we have four numbers, you go up, up, and down, then you record plus, plus, minus. Or, you know, on a really bad week, you know, you're here, minus, minus, minus. Okay? So that's... So we have a map from the 24 permutations to the 8 up-down sign patterns. Okay. So let's uh, connect, mark an edge if it connects two permutations with the same up-down pattern. Those are exactly the marked edges. Okay. So now pretend I'm shrinking the marked edges. I make them sort of smaller and smaller and smaller. I shrink them to nothing. You get the cube, right? Because if you shrink all the marked edges, then an entire class of permutations with the same up-down pattern becomes a vertex of the cube. So therefore, I want you to see the cube. Yeah, so this is clear? Yeah, so I just shrink all the edges um, so, for example, there are some classes that are large, right? So, so, for example, you know, here there are five permutations, so that becomes just one vertex of the cube. 
Uh, maybe there are some other ones that, you know, for example, here there's a class of three and, and so on. And then there are some classes like, you know, um, maybe minus, plus, minus. Oh no, that's over here. Okay, but you, you see the idea. Okay. So some classes, some up-down patterns are more likely than others. Right? Suppose if you have a uniform distribution on the symmetric group, then some sign patterns are more likely than others, depending how big the class is. Could you relate it to the previous? the same picture. Right? So it's the same picture. All I'm re recording is in the permutation whether I'm going up or down. Right? So up, down, up. Ah, the number. I go, yeah, number. down, down, up. So minus, minus, plus. Yeah? So like, you think about this sort of as a, I have a data set, I have four measurements. And my four measurements land somewhere, in one of the 24 permutations. But maybe I'm not interested in the permutation. All I'm interested in whether my stock value went up or down between two consecutive days. Okay. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. Four parts. First of all, I'm going to tell you about semi-graphoids and conditional independence. Then I'm going to tell you about convex rank tests. Then there's going to be one theorem that says they are the same. Okay? That the thing in the first part and the, in the second part is the same thing. And then time permitting, I'll tell you about mice. Okay? And I mean the little guys that run around in the lab. Okay? okay. So I'm going to write bracket n for the first n positive integers. And then I'm going to introduce a formal symbol. So I'm going to call a conditional independence statement. And it looks like this. I funny perp j bar k. Okay. That's a purely formal symbol this morning. That's a purely formal symbol for now. But k is a subset of 1 up to n. And i and j are elements, distinct elements in the complex. Okay, so k is any subset of at most, possibly the empty set, having at most n minus 2 elements. And then I pick two other guys that are in the complement. Okay. Okay, so, and furthermore, these formal symbols are symmetric under swapping i and j. Okay. So for example, if n is 2, there's only one such statement, right? There's 1 independent 2 given nothing, right? By Symmetry, there's only one such statement if n is 2. If n is 3, there are six statements. The blue one and the brown ones. Right? So there are six possibilities. Well, there are two possibilities for choosing, you know. Well, okay, so the k could either be the empty set. Right? You pick k, which is the empty set. Uh, and there are three ways of picking i or j. Or you pick k to be a singleton, and then the other, other guys are determined. Right? So there's six possibilities if n is 3. And then if n is you know, 4, there are more in, in black. So for example, you, know, you have things like 2 is independent of 3 given 1 and 4, or something. Right? So, so yesterday afternoon, these things had meaning. And this morning, they're just formal symbols for now. They don't have any meaning. Now all together, that's the number. So n choose 2 times 2 to the n minus 2. Okay, so there are this many ways of choosing the k, and there are that many ways of choosing i and j. Okay, that's the number of conditional independence. So I'd like you to notice that these are in bijection with the two-dimensional faces of the n-dimensional cube. Okay, well, how do you pick a two-dimensional face of the n-dimensional cube? Well, first of all, you pick the k. And the k tells us um, which coordinates are absolutely set to 0. Okay, that, that's the k. Okay. And then you pick the i and the j. And those are the coordinates that you're allowed to vary. 
You could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 in the coordinates i and j. And all other coordinates you set to 1. That's the two-dimensional phase of the n cube and all two-dimensional phase of the n cube come like that. So, so for example, there is the two-dimensional cube, also known as the square, has one two-dimensional phase. And the, the three-dimensional cube has six two-dimensional faces, and those are their names. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six two-dimensional faces of the three-dimensional cube. Again, the rule, yeah, K is the, core, is the collection of coordinates where, that are zero on that face. And the complement, everything that's not in K or I or J is all one. And then, you know, I and J, that's 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Okay. Okay. So I said there's almost, there's certainly no, there's a little bit of linear algebra, but no non-linear algebra in this lecture. But the, com the combinatorics gets a little complex. So now I'm going to introduce... Slowly, 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 I'm going to inject some life into these formal symbols. But I'm going to do it in a way that's different from yesterday. Okay? So I'm going to introduce formal variables, h sub something, where something is any subset of 1 up to n. So I'm going to introduce 2 to the n unknowns, h sub subset. And I associate with every conditional independent statement the linear form like this h i j k, by this I mean the union, minus h i j h i k minus h j k plus h k. Okay, so this is clear? So for example, you know, with this statement I associate h 2 3 minus h 2 minus h 3 plus h nothing. Okay? That's a linear form and 2 to the n unknowns. Uh, so h is a set function. It's a, it's a takes, maps the subsets of an n element set to the real numbers. Okay? And these linear forms are non-negative, maybe non-positive, if the function is submodular. Those are the submodular inequalities. So a matroid, given by its rank function, a matroid is such an H that's non-negative and takes values 1 on the singletons. Takes value 0 on the empty set and 1 on the singletons. That's called a matroid. Otherwise, you know, if it just has non-negative values in general, we sometimes, an integer values, we sometimes call this a polymatroid. In any case, these are submodular functions. Okay. Now these linear forms satisfy an important equation. Namely, this formal symbol plus that formal symbol is equal to this symbol plus that symbol. So this is just an equation that that they satisfy. Okay? And so to see that you plug in. Right? So you replace the four blue symbols by the corresponding linear forms and H's and then that's a formal, that's a relation. Okay? Um, well let's make a little sense out of this. Um, so, so this can be phrased uh, as a, a tropical matrix having tropical rank 1. Right? So, so for example, for n equals 3, there are six conditional independent statements according to the six faces of the cube. And these are these red ones. And if I put them into a 2 by 3 table, then the entropy equations are this plus that equals this plus that. And this plus that equals this plus that. And this, so it's a tropical rank 1 matrix. Okay. Those are, I have three linear equations among six formal symbols and two of them are linearly independent. Two independent equations among these six formal symbols. Okay, um, so in general for larger values of n these entropy equations come 
from the three-dimensional face of the n-cube. So if I have an n-dimensional cube, I look at every three-dimensional face. On each three-dimensional face, I write down these two linearly independent equations, and that system of equations I'm going to call the entropy equations of level n. Okay. Um, now, the set of non-negative solutions to these equations is the submodular cone, the cone of submodular functions. Right. So, the cone of submodular functions are vectors of length 2 to the n, assignments of the h's such that these linear functions are non-negative. But I can also put this in standard form in the linear programming sense as the non-negative solutions to linear equations and these are exactly the non-negative solutions to the linear entropy equations. That's the submodular cone. So the cone of submodular functions on the subsets of an n element set. It's a polyhedral cone. That's the non-negative solutions to these funny equations. Now why entropy? Well, most people use the letter H for entropy. Entropy or Helmholtz, okay? So H for entropy. That's a theorem of Shannon. But we'll get there. Okay. So the context of this lecture is statistical learning theory. So I should maybe make a qualifier. So this lecture is seven years old okay and my understanding of statistical learning and machine learning between now and seven years ago is very very different okay so I learned a lot and I also forgot a lot but certainly I knew nothing back then okay but but these are still very good books so there's a book by Judea, Judea Pearl that's widely used probabilistic reasoning intelligent systems it lays the foundations of causality, by the way, um, algebraic causality. There's a, there's a Czech literature from Prague. So Studeny has a very nice paper called Probabilistic Conditional Independent Structures. Rudy Yoshida is an expert on this stuff, by the way, too. And, and then there's this amazing paper, The Final Conclusions. You know? So Matus did this unbelievable you know, combinatorial classifications in three parts, one, two, and three, and that will also come up. So these are the questions that uh, Studeny and Matush ask. So uh, suppose you have a list of conditional independent statements. Are they consistent? Can they hold simultaneously in some distribution? Right. So again, we want to make statements about the world. Right. So elephants becoming extinct is independent of you know rain in Dijon, given whether France or Germany win tomorrow. Right. So you have uh, n random variables. And you just want to make statements about these random variables. And you want to ask, you want to reason about the world. So you want to say, given several such statements, are they consistent? Or are they contradictory? Or you have some statements, do they imply some other statement? Right? You want to put this on a solid foundation. And then these methods that I'm going to get to do that. Okay, so let's put a little bit of probabilistic life into my formal symbol. So suppose I have a joint probability distribution P on n random variables. And this distribution can be anything. Okay? This could be a discrete distribution, it could be a Gaussian distribution, it could be some other distri distribution. Right? So you all know, you know, one of the myths about the banking crisis is these guys use the Gaussians, right? So that's why it all failed. So now there are other distributions. So any distribution, does disregard whatever the cumulants or kurtosis might be, any joint distribution on n random variables, okay? And these variables can be anything, right? The value of Microsoft stock and Google stock and something, okay? Um, now for any subset i of the random variables, there is a number called the entropy. So this is the total entropy, the entropy of the ith marginalization of p. Okay? So if we're in the discrete case, then marginalization is simply the table that we get by summing out the other coordinates. So, and, uh, and then we take the entropy. So in the discrete case, that's minus you know, the sum of all p times log p. Right? That's the entropy. And in the continuous case, there's a, an integral formula. Or there's also no, something called the differential entropy. Okay, so, so for instance, in the Gaussian case, the h i is the logarithm 
of the determinant of the i by i minor of the principal minor. Okay, so in the Gaussian case, we take the principal minors of the log debt of the principal minors of the covariance matrix. They're positive numbers, so we can take the logarithm. Okay. Okay, so we have a joint entropy vector H, and that's a vector in two to the n dimensional space. We have any distribution on n random variables, you get a vector. Okay, not any. I mean, maybe you need some cal. I mean, absolutely, you know, continuous. You know, there's some um, the density has to be integrable or something. So on some calculus assumption on the density, then you can integrate. You have a joint entropy vector in two to the n dimensional space. So Shannon observed that, possibly even earlier, but certainly in the 50s, Shannon knew that the joint entropy vector of any such distribution is submodular. Okay. So the, the, the entropy, joint entropy always satisfies the submodular inequalities. So we can assign this number. So we look at this number. It's a non-negative number, and we assign that to this variable. Okay. So now that formal variable symbol has a number, right? So as soon as you have a, a distribution, with that distribution I'm assigning a non-negative number to my formal symbol, okay? Now if you have a non-negative number, it can be two things. It could be either positive or zero. Right? If this number is zero, then the conditional independence holds for the distribution P. If and only if. Okay. So now we're at an interesting point in this lecture. Right? Either you already knew the, different, the, the definition of conditional independence in some other setting. Suppose some other setting, you still remember some definition of conditional independence for distribution. In that case, that's a theorem. Suppose you've never heard any definition ever of conditional independence, or you heard one, you forgot it, then that's a definition. Okay? So for example, if you remember yesterday's definition in the Gaussian case, that's equivalent to this. Or you remember yesterday's definition in the discrete case, right? So Charles Chan and Rosé wrote down these ratios, right? This was some definition. That's equivalent. So then that's a thing. So we have conditional independence if and only if the joint entropy vector lies on the facet of the submodular cone indexed by that symbol. Right? This is a facet defining inequality in the polyhedral cone of submodular functions, and we are on that facet if and only if this statement holds. Now what are we learning? Right? We're learning that probabilistically realizable sets of conditional independence statements are classified by certain faces of the submodular cone. Right? So the upshot of this slide is that you know, if you have a bunch of conditional independent statements, 27 of them, right? in order for them to re be realizable, they must be realizable, they must be exactly the facet, they must intersect as facets on this cone. There must be a face on the cone of submodular functions that lies precisely on those 27 facets. That's it. Right? That's nice, right? Because this, in principle, says that linear programming can be used to study these questions. Right? At the formal level, whether some conditional independent statements are consistent at all or imply others, well, we just want to know, you know, suppose we have some point on this cone and we already know it lies on these 27 facets, does that imply that it also lies on some other facet, right? So for example, you know, let's try, you know, think about an Egyptian pyramid. So here's a polytope, right, the Egyptian pyramid like this, okay? And suppose, you know, we have a point on this polytope that lies on this triangle, and that triangle over there, okay? Well, then we can conclude that it also lies on that front triangle, right? That's, if this statement holds and that statement holds about the world, then that statement also holds, right? That's the idea. Okay, now, 
The certain is very important. because a, a wide open problem to actually classify which joint entropy vectors come from a particular setting. Extremely important problem. Okay? So for example, in the Gaussian case, let's think about the Gaussian. Okay? So in the Gaussian case, we have a low dimensional round cone, the PSD cone of all distributions. So it's a cone of dimension n plus 1 choose 2. Then we have a map from this low, low, low dimensional round cone into that high dimensional polyhedral cone. Polyhedral cone of submodular function. What's the map, right? So Rainer gives me a positive definite matrix. I write down log det for every principal minor. And I make a big vector, right? Then uh, that satisfies some equations where Spencer, he knows about them. So, okay, so I get some low dimensional set inside the submodular cone. To classify the image is wide open, but certainly we can use that. Okay, so that was part one. Now we come to the definition of a semi graphoid. A semi graphoid is sort of like a matroid, it goes like this. Consider a set of conditional independent statements on 1 up to n. Or equivalently, a set of two-dimensional faces of the n-cube. Right? Those are the same. So I have the two-dimensional face of the n-cube, I just take some subset. These are conditional independent statements. I'm going to say it's a semi-graphoid if the following axiom holds. If this guy and that guy are in m, then also the other two guys are in M. Okay? Now where on earth does this come from? Well, that's exactly coming from our entropy equation. Right? We have this blue equation among four non-negative numbers. But if you have four non-negative numbers where the first two in their sum is equal to the last two in their sum, and if the first two are zero, then the other two have to be zero. Okay? Equivalently, on the Egyptian pyramid, if we're already on this facet and on that facet, we're also on the other two. That's a geometric way to think about it. Okay? So if, that's all we're saying, right? We're just measuring which of these things can be simultaneously zero. Right? You know? And all we're saying is, you know, if this is zero and that is zero, then these two have to be zero also, right? Otherwise, you can't have tropical rank one. So that's a semi graphoid. Okay. I'm going to say a semi-graphoid is submodular if it's globally consistent. If M is the set of zero coordinates to a non-negative solution of the entropy equation. Right? So if you have an actual vector H in the submodular cone and corresponding numbers for the formal symbol that realize that M, then we're going to say that's a consistent or submodular. Okay. Um, well, you can classify these things. So, for example, for n equals 3, there are 22 semi graphoids and they are all submodular. So, the submodular cone in this case is an eight dimensional cone. The eight subsets of a three element set. So, there's eight dimensions of functions from subsets to the real numbers. We have the eight dimensional cone of submodular functions. That cone has a four-dimensional lineality space modulo that four-dimensional lineality space we have a four-dimensional pointed cone a four-dimensional pointed cone as a cross-section is a three-dimensional polytope and this polytope is the bipyramid which has five vertices nine edges and six triangles For n equals 4, there are 26,424 semi graphoids. Okay, so, among all subsets, among all millions of possible sets of conditional independent statements, most are ruled out by this axiom. Only 26,000 have a chance of being realizable, and of those, 22,108 lie on the submodular cone. Okay, so the submodular cone is a 16-dimensional cone 
because there are 16 subsets of a four element set. That 16 dimensional cone has a five dimensional linearity space, so we get an 11 dimensional pointed cone or a 10 dimensional polytope, and that 10 dimensional polytope altogether has 26,424 faces. And we did it for n equals 5, 2. Maybe we tried for 6. These things explode in number. So those are semi-graphoids. New topic. Pretend you just entered. Entirely new topic. A rank test is any partition of the symmetric group. Okay, so you have the symmetric group Sn and I partition it into blocks. I'm going to call that a rank test. Okay? So what's the idea? Okay? What, 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 what I mean by a test? Okay? So you have uh, n measurements, and these are n numbers. You measure n things. These are n distinct numerical numbers, okay? And you want to rank them somehow, right? So there's a permutation, right? But you're not interested in the permutation. You're interested in some features, right? So maybe, you know, value of Microsoft stock was higher on Thursday than on Monday. That you're interested in, right? Or, so you're not interested in the entire permutation, but some statistic that you can read off from the permutation. Okay. Maybe the number of inversions or something, right? So there's a reason why people at MIT, for example, talk about permuta permutation statistics, right? So there's people call about permutation statistics. They are statistics of permutations, okay? So rank test is any permit partition of the symmetric group, okay? Now what rank tests make sense? Well, I'm going to say a rank test is pre-convex if the following holds. If it consists of all, where the, the classes, all the linear extensions in some post set, okay? And, and that's equivalent to saying that the classes are convex unions of the cones, right? So I have, you know, the, uh, I have my hyperplane arrangement, xi equals xj, it cuts up data space into n factorial chambers. Right? So I make, you know, I have these chambers and a rank test is any partition of these cones, but I want these parts to be convex. Right? That sort of makes sense. Right? So if I have a data set and I, it has some statistic, and Vissarion has some other data set that has the same statistic, then on the segment between us, everybody should have the same statistic. So, you know, the set of all data vectors that have the same statistic should be a convex set, okay? So, for example, for n equals 3, you know, uh, my three-dimensional space is cut up into uh, six chambers like this. Maybe I say these three guys are in the same cluster, and, you know, these are all different. That's an example of a pre-convex rank test. Okay. Now, it's not quite a convex rank test because this is not a fan. Okay? So in a fan, the intersection of any two cones has to be a common face of each. And that's not true in this case. right? So if I have this half space and then this little cone, you know, they don't fit together to make a fan. Right? Because their intersection is not a face of the, of the upper cone. Okay? So the last definition, a convex rank test is a partition of Sn that's actually defined by a fan in R to the n that coarsens the hyperplane arrangement, xi equals xj. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So I have any coarsening of the fan, but I think of this as a permutation statistic. I really want to, and statistic in a sense, I want to apply this to data. Right? I have n numbers, and now I've partitioned my space into cones according to a fan, and I put them into these bins. Okay. A little bit more combinatorics. Let's come back to the permutahedron. The normal fan of the permutahedron is this hyperplane arrangement. Okay? So the reflection arrangement, you know, xi equals xj is the normal fan. The n factorial chambers are the normal cones at the vertices of the permutahedron. Um, okay, now buckle your seatbelt, okay? So the edges of the permutahedron 
They correspond to walls in the SN arrangement, co-dimension one cones. Okay? Now those, I claim, correspond to the two-dimensional faces of the n-cube and hence to conditional independent statements. Okay? Now there are several ways to, do, to see that, but let me visualize one way to see that bijection or map. Okay? So here's the n-cube, but let me draw the n-cube like this. So it's the Boolean lattice of subsets of 1 up to n. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you know, the three cube, but I'm going to draw it like this as a post set. Right? So the edge graph looks like this. Right? So it's the Boolean post set subsets of 1 up to n ordered by inclusion. Now what's a permutation? A permutation is a maximal chain from the bottom to the top. You okay with that, right? So a permutation means I start at the empty set, then I take one guy in, and then another guy, and then another guy. So traveling from the bottom to the top, I have n factorial ways. Those are the permutations. Okay, so the path from bottom to top are the vertices of the permutahedron. Edges of the permutahedron connect two vertices and so therefore they connect two paths. Two paths are connected if they differ exactly along a two-dimensional face. Right? So two of these paths are neighbors as permutations of the permutahedron if and only if you know, they swap along a two-face of the, of the three-cube. So therefore I have a map from the edges of the permutahedron to the faces of the two phases of the n-cube and therefore I can label, non-uniquely, each edge of the permutahedron by a conditional dependent state. Okay, so here's the two-dimensional permutahedron. In this case it's a one-to-one -one map, right? There are six edges. Each edge corresponds by the method I just explained while making my hands white to the six faces of the three-dimensional cube and so this is the name. Okay, so each edge has a name. And you can actually do this. So if you have an edge in the permutahedron, for example, between 2, 1, and 3, and 2, 3, 1, what you do is you, you read it, you read these words from left to right, and everything, so for a while they'll agree. Right? 2 agrees with 2, that's the set K. The set K is, you'll read from left to right, they agree, that's the set K. Then they're going to differ in an I and a J, and then afterwards they agree again. Right? So that's how we read off the conditional dependent statement for two neighboring permutations. It gets harder. Okay. Or now we go. Hmm? Oh, this one. So we read them from left to right. They disagree immediately. So k is the empty set. So we have one and three are independent given the empty set. So here they agree, right? So here we have one is independent of two given three. Here we have uh, two is independent of three given one. Here we have one is independent of two given nothing. Right? So you read from left to right, and for a while they'll agree, right? Those random variables you put into K, and then they're gonna disagree, you know, at an I and a J, and then you know we'll ignore the rest. Okay, guys, let's increase the dimension by one. Okay? Well, edges of the permutahedron correspond to two faces of the n-cube. Two-dimensional faces of the permutahedron correspond to three-dimensional faces of the n-cube. Okay? So, well, what are the two faces? They are squares and hexagons. Let's ignore the squares for a moment. Let's concentrate on the hexagon. Now, what's a hence hexagon? A hexagon on the three-cube, that corresponds to a three-dimensional face on the n-cube. Exactly, right? So if you have a hexagon worth of vertices on the permutahedron, that means you have a hexagon worth of paths from bottom to top. Right? So you have six paths from the bottom of the n-cube to the top of the n-cube that form a ring of six guys. Well, that's it. Okay? That's a three-cube. So somewhere in the n-cube, which you draw as the Hasse diagram, you pick up a three-cube. Well, what's a three cube? Every three cube has a name, and a name is a triple of entropy equations, right? A two by three matrix of tropical rank one. Okay. Very good. Okay, so now we've decorated our permutahedron. 
We have the n minus one dimensional permutahedron, the vertices are the permutations, the edges are the conditional independent statements, they're marked by conditional independent statements. The hexagons are marked by triples of entropy. Here's the theorem. Okay. It's a bit, the combinatorics is a little tricky. I mean, you have to sort of get into this, but I, I like it a lot, okay? So here's the main theorem of the talk. So a convex rank test, well, so that's just a fan that coarsens the SN hyperplane arrangement, is characterized by the collection of walls that you remove to passing to the fan from the SN arrangement, right? So, so for example, you know, one convex rank test is this guy is alone, this guy is alone, these two are together, and these two are together, and I simply remember the names of the walls that got knocked out. So this co-dimension one cone has this name, this co-dimension one cone has that name, so that's my set of names. So for any convex rank test F maps to a set MF of conditional independent statements corresponding to the missing walls. Okay? The theorem says that this map is a bijection. So the map that takes a convex rank test and assigns to it the corresponding conditional independent statements maps exactly to the semigraphoid. So given a fan here, you get a semigraphoid and vice versa. It's a bijection. Convex rank tests are in bijection with semigraphoids. Okay? So what I'm saying here is if you have the three-dimensional permutahedron, the normal fan, which has, you know, 24 regions, there are 26,424 fans that coarsen this. Of those fans, 22,108 are normal fans of polytopes. These are called generalized permitahedron. Okay, so that's the main theorem. Okay, let's illustrate that, you know. So for example, you know, we can go either way. So here's a, a convex rank test. So I'm marking a bunch of edges here on the permutahedron. Um, so then that means I'm shrinking these permutahedron, these edges to zero. Okay, I'm shrinking them to zero. Um, that means I'm knocking out the walls in the hyperplane range. I do a blow down in the toric variety, right? In terms of toric topology, popular topic at Teist, I make the symplectic volume of this torus orbit zero. Right? I have the moduli space, the secondary cone, of the, amp the Mori cone of all you know, ample divisors on this toric variety, and I make the symplectic volume zero of these curves. Right? That's what the toric topologist would say. So those are the ones I make zero, and then this is a semi-graphoid. Okay? That's how it goes. That's a condition. Now, now you can look at this and you can do, you know, Gaussians and you can do the thing you did yesterday with this set of conditional dependent statements. Okay? Um, well, there was some parallel work, you know, there was some work of Postnikov, Reiner and Williams, for example, and later by Postnikov, and they asked the question actually in their paper, which was answered by this picture. So, um, so they asked the question, uh, if you have a, a, a simplicial fan that coarsens the SN arrangement, is this always the normal fan of a polytope? So is every simple polytope that you get this way, you know, can you, everything that looks like a, a solution, to, can that actually be realized? The answer is no. Okay, so, so this particular semi-graphoid comes from a simplicial fan that is not submodular. Okay, so if I take this picture, so this is gotten from the permutahedron, so here uh, I shrunk a, a, a rectangular face, right, so there was a square and I squashed it to uh, an edge. Yeah, so this, you know, if you fill in, you know, a here you fill in a square face, here you fill in a square face, then you recover the permutahedron. Okay? So if you shrink four of the six square faces, was it six? One, two, three, what am I doing? <coughs> oh yeah, so two are surviving, right? So you, so you take six, you four of them, you shrink according to this pattern, then you get a polytope, but that's not realizable, and there's the proof. Okay. So it is still a semi-graphoid, 
But uh, here's the proof, right? So we take this, 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 this entropy equation, right? So these should be on, if this polytope is realizable, these are non-negative numbers, right? So I take your z values, I take your z values, they are here the h values, from your z values I compute these non-negative numbers. And these non-negative numbers satisfy these equations where, you know, uh, these things are zero. So if this were a submodular, there would be a solution where the blue unknowns are zero and everything else is positive. Okay, uh, but then you add the right-hand side and the left-hand side, the black stuff cancels out, and four positive numbers sum to zero. So that's the proof. So it's a very short proof. Right? So there's a, a fan, a simplicial fan that's not the normal fan of a simple uh, three-dimensional generalized permetahedron. Now, which semigraphoids should you study? Right? So there's a billion conditional independence modules, but we already narrowed it down to only 26,000, right? So 22,000. Among those, which ones should we study? Well, everybody loves graphs, right? So um, we have identified submodular semigraphoids with polytopes, pi f, which back then didn't really have a name. Now they are called generalized permutahedra. But the most popular semi-graphoids in statistics are the graphical models. That's why they're called semi-graphoids, right? Because they generalize graphical models, either directed or undirected, for example, Markov random fields. But those are the popular ones, right? So i is independent of j given everybody else, a Markov random field. Those are the popular condition dependent statements. In mathematics, the most popular polytopes whose normal fan coarseness the SN arrangement are the associahedra the graph associahedra. There's the, the classical associahedron, there's the bot taubes polytope, that's the cyclohedron. So whenever you have a graph, then there's a, a polytope and those are the ones people like best. Okay? They're nested sets and so on. Okay? The second theorem is they are the same. Under my bijection, they are the same. Graphical models, undirected graphical models in the sense of statistics are equal to graph a sociohedra in the sense of math. Very gratifying theorem, right? Because it says that this is really the right bijection. You know? So I have this crazy set in bijection with that crazy set. On the left-hand side, I have mathematically meaningful objects coming from graphs. On the right-hand side, I have statistically meaningful objects from graphs. They are the same, okay? That's the theorem. Um, for example, that graph might be the cycle, the n cycle. So here's the cyclohedron. The cyclohedron is the polytope that you get by contracting edges on the permutahedron. And the edges you contract have names, and their names are i is independent of j, given the rest, if i and j are not connected on the n cycle. You get this bot taubes polytope, also known as the cyclohedron. Okay? Very nice polytope. Can you explain why the numbers are stacked like that just for location? Oh, this one? Yeah. So here I've contracted, uh, so I contracted a pair of edges. So this was a, uh, a rectangle. So on that rectangle I have four permutations. One, three, two, four, three, one, two, four. One, three, four, two. 2, 1, 4, 3, but then I contract this edge, right? That edge has the name. 1 is independent of 3, given everything, given nothing. 1 is independent of 3, and here I'm contracting, uh, uh, let me see, maybe I'm contracting the other way around. 1 is independent of 3, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Sometimes you read from left or right. So, so the, this is supposed to, like yesterday, right? So this is supposed to correspond to Right, so we're on the n cycle, one, two, three, four. So we have the statement, one is independent of three given two, four, and two is independent of four given one, three, right? So now they are the names. This is the name of two parallel edges on the permutahedron. That's the name of two other parallel edges. I contract them and that's the pattern. Okay.
biology, my love. <laughs> okay, now a little bit, let me end, wrap this up. This is a, it's very hard to work as a mathematician in biology. And we need a lot of help. So back then, seven years ago, I was full of youthful enthusiasm, you know. Back then I was young, 45, you know, I was part of this program, Fundamental Laws and Biology, and we felt that we were going to do it, right? We're going to connect math and biology, and we're going to do it within the next year, okay? Not so easy, okay? Not so easy, but worthwhile. But you guys have to help. You and your kids and your grandkids. I mean, this requires time and effort, okay? To actually connect mathematics and biology. Um, anyway, so we were in this project with the people at the Stowers Institute in Kansas City. There's a Stowers Institute. It's actually politically very interesting. So they're in Kansas City, okay? Which is in Missouri, actually. And so there's local politics, and usually the people who don't believe in evolution win elections. Now, that's a bit at odds at getting biomedicine right, right? You something also, on the one hand, you know, so they actually became a major player. In, in the state politics, and, in, uh, and they really wanted to, anyway, that's the Star Wars Institute, okay? So they believe in evolution. And so in somitogenesis, it's a process during the embryonic development in vertebrates. So vertebrates is like you and me, we have a vertebrate, you know, vertebrae in the back. So a backbone that has a bunch of vertebrae. So maybe for the purpose of this discussion, let's say 17. It's probably wrong, but let's say we have 17 vertebrae in the backbone, okay? Now, this forms at some point, and there are precursors to this, called somites, okay? Now, I think biology is amazing, okay? How does life work, okay? Well, at the beginning there's one cell, and then there are two, and then there are four, and then there are eight, right? They divide, right? At the beginning you start as one cell, and then you become many cells, and then eventually they differentiate, right? and they take on different functions in the embryo. So this sort of goes on and then at the end you know you get arms and the liver and many 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 different functions but it starts all by cell division. Well how do these cells know that you know some of them should become your eye or your something right? How do they, how, how does this actually work? That's kind of a miracle, okay? So somatogenesis is a process that turns on couple days in the development. So I think on this, this was on mouse, and I forgot the details. So I think it starts on day seven in the development. Okay, so the cell divides and mouse embryo forms. So on day seven, a clock starts ticking. Okay, a clock turns on. That then cells divide, and every 90 minutes, a new somite is formed. That's a, a certain perturbation, a differentiation, the cell division. That will be a vertebrate, you know, and it gets formed at that moment. Then another 90 minutes later, another somite gets formed, and so on. And that goes on for a day and a half. What's 17 times 90? Okay, so that goes on for a day and a half, and then the clock is off. And then, you know, the organism grows. Right? So then it develops. And there's some pictures, you know, here, so, okay, there's a mouse. And then somewhere early in the development, does it say which day? I forgot. Yeah, so these somites gets from, so let's say 17, okay? What runs the clock? Right? So that's the question, right? So what, what makes the clock turn on on day seven, make a somite every 90 minutes, and then turn the clock off again, right? You don't want to produce more and more, you know, at some point you want to stop, right? So that was the question. I think that's a very interesting question. If I can make a little contribution, that would be nice. Right? So, so there we were, you know. Okay, so they had data. So they wanted to know which genes run the clock. Okay, so there are many genes, right? So in the genome, there are about 30,000 genes. And they knew some genes that were uh, part of this clock, but they didn't know, right? All the genes. So they wanted to test, you know. So at that time, Eons ago, by biological standards, eight years ago, they had a technology called microarray data. Okay? Now here's the thing when you work with biologists. It's a data-driven science. It depends on technology. So nobody uses microarrays anymore. 
right? This was the thing that everybody used eight years, ag years ago. Now you do so-called high throughput sequencing experiments. I mean, there's new technology and the methods changes. Your math, you know, whatever pa R packages you write, new technology, new math, new statistics. Right? It's, a, it's very, very fast. So back then they all did microarrays. So a microchip can measure gene expression levels on tens of thousands of genes simultaneously. That's too small. Nowadays they can do much, much, much more. Okay? So 17 measurements were conducted within Wien, Wien cycle and that has to do with the 17 time points in this development. And then here's a particular gene called exon, right? And then we measure at these on a logarithmic scale, right? So the expression level is some positive number. We take the logarithm and we get some number that's positive or negative. Okay? So these are the expression levels at the first time point, the second thing, seven, up the 17th time point. That's the data. So we had 20,000 vectors like that. Okay? Now the question is, which of these 20,000 genes exhibits cyclic behavior? I want to know. It's a clock, right? Which sort of, you know, exhibits a cyclic behavior? Um, so let's, first of all, ignore all these numbers and just remember the rank vector. Let's just remember what's the largest number, what's the second largest number, and so on. And let's devise a convex rank test that we're going to apply to these data. And which test should we use? Well, we use the cyclohedron test. So we wanted to know whether this is cyclic behavior, so we use the cyclohedron. So here you get these pictures, 20,000 of them, right? So this gene, you know, the values go up and down like this. Time is up. Huh? So Okay, so then you can use convex rank tests, and then there was a paper with uh, other people, and uh, to find cyclic genes, we used the cyclohedron test, blah, blah. We also did this on some other plant data. So then we plot these, you know, so it's a graphical test specified by the cyclohedron. It's designed to detect association of the data with the end cycle. So how do we use this test? Well, in the end, we're going to rank these genes. We're going to say this gene called O-box we believe is the most associated with cyclic behavior. Okay. And then the second one is this one. Right? So these are our top 16 genes. Okay. Now there's a lot of, you have to do this very carefully, you have to devise something called a p-value. Okay. That's a hard concept. That's a concept in freshman statistics that is very difficult for mathematicians to understand. And that's why on Wednesday afternoon we have a session on freshman statistics. So, so there's a p-value. But what this is, these are the volumes of the cones. This is the number of cones, uh, the number of permutations that lie in O boxes class. So O box lands in a class in the cyclohedron test. That class is a convex union of Sn, of permutations. There are precisely 480 permutations of 17 that land in the same class, and so on. Right? So these numbers we compute rapidly. That's the number of linear extensions of a post set, right? so, and so on. So the argument is that somehow, if you're an outlier, if you lie in a small class, if there are very few permutations that have the same pattern, as you do in the cyclohedron test, that means you are significant. Okay? And blah, 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 the p-values, you know, maybe I have only minus six minutes left, so there's a paper that I love. And then let me end, okay? Um, now in my youthful enthusiasm, seven, eight years ago, I love to put up these kind of conclusions. The conclusion for statisticians is that combinatorics and geometry, polytopes, are useful for data analysis. There's a conclusion for biologists, there's an R package you can use. We wrote an R package that they can type in their 20,000 vectors and get some ranking of their genes. But to make sense to the biologists, you have to provide a package that they can run on their data. Okay? That, that produces output that makes sense to them. Okay? And then, you know, of course, the mathematicians, right? So mathematicians, I try to tell them that statistics and biology are cool things to do. 
The Langlands program is very cool. Number theory is very cool. But so are statistics. And so are, you know, somites. I think it's amazing to figure out how life works. But it's an uphill battle. So I would like to say I haven't gotten fully in worked so much on this in the last couple of years. Not so much because I don't it's interesting, but it's it's hard. It's a hard thing and I need help. I, I need your help. Okay? And the other thing, maybe let me end on a very personal note. So this is the end of the class. I'm going to end on a very personal note. So one mathematician and luckily co-author passed away who I learned a lot from is Giancarlo Rota. Rota had many, many, many wisdoms. And one of them he said, he told me this when I was very young, he said, Bernd, at some point, you know, in your career, you cease to be a person and you become an institution. Okay? And I think that happened to me around that time. Okay? And as an institution, I was not ready. As a person, I was ready to work on biology problems. But as an institution, I couldn't. Right? As an institution, I'm, I'm in the math, I'm, I'm who I am in the math world. You know? But uh, I, I still am enthusiastic about statistics and biology, and I'd like to share that with you. Thanks for coming and for sticking around until the end.